Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mark. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about why I think it's sort of an important problem to solve, which is uh, creating 100 PyTorch backends. So this is like a summary of many, many discussions I've had with people that are significantly smarter than me. So a lot of their names are here. So thank you. All right. Um, so uh, for the most part in like AI infrastructure, like the sort of dominant meme is people are fairly conservative of what they need to rewrite. Like this is why you sort of often hear sort of like labels like, oh, there's a moat and you know, we like there's nothing you can do. It's just a moat and it's there forever. Um, and now the other extreme, you have people that are like, oh, like we must like rewrite everything, right? So the goal today is I want to give you like a more balanced take on what I think should be rewritten versus not. So an algorithm that has sort of had backwards compatibility guarantees for like over 200 years now is MATML. The API has remained extremely stable. It's like an MM, takes in two arguments, A and B, and outputs like a third tensor. Uh, for the most part, this actually, even, even if you involve like systems level changes, this API is still backwards compatible because you can just pass in different KWARGs. Like whether it's like tile size A, B, kernel launch parameters, like whatever you want, you just like stuff it and this API has remained backwards compatible. Um, so similarly, I want to talk about like what this sort of looks like for deep learning. Like obviously MATML is the most important algorithm. Uh, but in PyTorch, we have like a list of like mathy functions we call ops. So you can imagine things like argmax, uh, sine, uh, cosine. Like these are things where their definitions do not change over time. Um, if you were like a student, you might have noticed there's one that is a systemy API, like as strided. Like this is kind of like where PyTorch, like often because it needs to get performance, needs to be aware of the hardware, and a strided is like a way of like reading uh, tensors in, in, mem in memory. Um, this API, for what it's worth, was not invented by PyTorch. It was mostly inspired by NumPy. Um, NumPy was released in 95. And so we basically have the same high level APIs for linear algebra in like real programming languages that have stood the test of, the test of time for at least like 30 years. And so my claim is like, why do we need to reinvent this? And I, I would argue that we do not and we should reinvent other things. So what's PyTorch, right? So this is like an example of a very simple PyTorch program and like a lot goes on into this. You import Torch, you're creating a tensor. Um, once you say the like, device equals CUDA, it means you're instantiating some like memory on the GPU. When you say X is equals X plus one, uh, you're basically broadcasting the one into a vector, making a vector sum, dispatching a, a kernel to the CUDA device. And this is all asynchronous, but when you print something, you basically force a synchronization, read the value of X, and then similarly, when you do a cosine or you do a relu, you're like launching a different uh, CUDA version. So uh, actually like a, like a big part of why PyTorch became so successful was because you could print things and printing things was like quite hard to get right and you basically necessitate this like eager programming model to make it work. Um, so fundamentally, you can think of like, you know, LLMs, compilers, PyTorch, like all of these, like I think of them as like sort of string in and string out. So the string that you're taking in as input is like a bunch of Python code. And initially in like eager mode, there's a string out is like a bunch of like CUDA code. The machinery for how we get to this CUDA code can be quite complex, but like fundamentally you can think of it in this like black box way. Torch compile is no different. With torch compile, for example, if you say like torch compile torch.square, as opposed to code generating a CUDA kernel, uh, we code generate a Trident kernel. And this is extremely convenient for us because it lets us pre-process things and do fusions. And because GPUs got so fast, like in recent years, memory bandwidth bottlenecks are sort of like the primary thing you need to deal with. And which is why like Torch Compile is effectively a fusion compiler. But again, it can code generate like arbitrary strings, like this could be uh, Trident, it could be CUDA, it could be, um, it could be C++, it could be Mojo, like well, just like really any, anything you want. Uh, and often like when Torch Compile came out, like the a very natural question for people is like, well, why do I need to write custom kernels again? Again, like, what's the point of a hackathon like this? And I really like this exchange on the Flash Attention 2 paper by like reviewer, let's call them reviewer number two, which is like, why couldn't have a compiler generated Flash Attention? And, and, and the trick is basically compilers are very good at doing a large set of like very dumb optimizations. Compilers cannot and likely will never be able to mathematically reason through your program and rewrite it to keep it numerically stable but also faster. Like these are things so far we haven't managed to do without templating. Um, so again, PyTorch is a very flexible framework. So we need to support like arbitrary models, like not just like the model that happens to be the most popular today. But we also need to do this without like turning the code size, like trend, making the code size trend to infinity. So we, we really want performance without like too much like binary bloat. So examples of easy kernels and things like you shouldn't be handwriting are like if you find yourself writing a 
fused amem and aralu, and a fused amem then a gelu and a lulu. Like this is silly. Like this this means you need probably we probably need some meta programming and compilers to help us out. But for things like hard kernels, like basically things like a matmol or like a flash attention, like these are extremely important to still optimize like via humans. So yeah, for easy kernels use a compiler, and for uh, hard kernels use a smart human. So I have an opinionated take on this, which is that like if you look at sort of the spectrum of uh, tooling, um, you have sort of on one extreme math where there's no implementation detail, and it's like always like backwards and forward compatible. Like this is amazing. PyTorch is kind of close to this, and that is like the, again the goal is to maximize resource productivity. Performance is a goal because of course we run on GPUs, but it's not like the primary goal. The Trident and compiler are go like a bit lower. Thunder Kittens kind of like Cutlass, but easier to read. Cutlass very fast for matmols. And then once you get like to CUDA or PTX, like this is kind of where these technologies become useful for like surgical improvements, but not necessarily to write your whole model. So for what it's worth, the trade-offs so far have been the less usable your programming language is, like the faster it is. And you know, at least I'm fairly optimistic about like Mojo being able to break this kind of chart. Like I'll, I, I just I need to come up with something else because I can't put it on the left or the right. So let's see. Um, so again, um, our, our design principles, and I've seen um, and I've seen folks like often often get this wrong with PyTorch, is that like our design principles are we are like simple over easy. We value usability over performance, and we're Python first. In practice, for example, off people often ask me, like, well, why don't you have like a fused RMS norm in PyTorch? And that's because we tend to be very conservative about what kernels to add. Like PyTorch is already like a four gigabyte binary, and people are like, why don't you add more? But also the binary is too big. So we tend to be like very slow about making decisions here. But um, obviously people want to be able to make their code faster, right? So which brings me to sort of the main, main point, which is like if we were to speculate how many data center GPUs are running PyTorch, like my thesis is, is it's either a lot or most of them. Um, and if you want like basically your performance work to have like meaningful distribution, like basically accelerating things that people care about, then you should try making PyTorch faster. So the problem though is, you know, we don't really merge things very easily in PyTorch. So how can you make PyTorch faster without merging code in PyTorch, All right? Um, so the, the, the sort of like most user friendly API is like what we call custom operators. So this is typically used for like our C++ extensions. Um, and what you can do here is you basically sort of register what your input and output arguments are, whether there's any sort of like input or output mutation. Um, and you can basically just call like native code. And you know, I'm really thrilled that this like works just fine on Mojo today. So if you're looking for like a hackathon project, I would like strongly recommend you find something that's slow in a real model on Hugging Face and like write a Mojo kernel for it. Like I think this is sort of like, you know, I would bet like someone who does a good job here will probably win the hackathon, but no promises because I'm not a judge. <laughs> um, so, and so, so, so this is sort of like aspirational, but like here's a demo by like Steph, like modular that I've been collaborating with on this. Effectively, like a lot of this is boilerplate, which kind of like the slide where here is like abstracting away. But the, the, the really the core thing you need to think about is like, well, how do you sort of take arbitrary data from like a Mojo program to like a PyTorch program. And a lot of the sort of subtlety here is in basically being able to read like an arbitrary like pointer in memory and converting this to a PyTorch tensor. So this is what most of this boilerplate is. But again, you just like call this function, it works with torch compile, and then you can like look at, for example, the Mojo code here for like what a grayscale kernel might look like. And then it's like really up to you to decide how do you feel about this kind of programming experience versus uh, CUDA versus like Rockham versus like Triton. And then I think like again, this kind of hackathon will, will really help to help you form an opinion. All right, I'm almost done. All right, um, this is like more some like advice I have for people that are trying to integrate with PyTorch. So for example, one of the reasons why Triton became so big in the PyTorch ecosystem, like they're very subtle things. Uh, but for example, when you're launching a Trident kernel, it uses your default PyTorch device. It launches on the default like CUDA stream. It like reuses the PyTorch memory allocator. And so as a result, like the experience is just seamless and you're never having to worry about like what is a pointer and stuff like that. So we've had like these very nice collaborations both with the, with the GeoHot on TinyGrad uh, and also like the NVIDIA CUDA team on basically making it so that like if you're interopping like a custom kernel language with PyTorch tensors, like things just work. And I think we can sort of build very similar APIs in Mojo as well. All right. But, but like fundamentally here, we're still sort of forcing you to write every individual op, right? Like fundamentally, like 
this, which means that the out of the box performance for, let's say, a Mojo backend will still be sort of very hit or miss because like a human needs to come in and author all these ops. But we have like very nice approaches for this. Like specifically, there's a really neat project uh, called Flags Gems. And what this does is it effectively like monkey patches all of the PyTorch operators. And instead, instead of like calling CUDA kernels, it hijacks them and calls like Trident kernels. I really, really like this project, and I think it's like entirely feasible within the context of a hackathon to even vibe code your way through like something like this. So good luck. Um, the, the last thing I will say is that like um, it depends on how low level the programming language is. Like I guess we're all going to learn today, like kind of what Mojo's what, what what it's like to program. Is it like a, is it closer to Trident? Is it like do you have to worry about your custom memory allocations and like how does pseudo randomness get done? So we also have like an API uh, for you to register your own device. So you could do something like to Mojo, and then that'll effectively be like a fully fledged device and accelerator. Um, although granted, like as I'm working with the Mojo team, like I would hope that they sort of pick an experience that looks kind of like this. All right. And of course, like, we're going to have like a lot of accelerator APIs. So you know, we, we don't want an if Mojo available to our device Mojo. So we now have like a device agnostic accelerator API to sort of remove a lot of if conditions in your code. All right. So yeah, I mean, to conclude, my argument is like the PyTorch front end will stand the test of time. Even if PyTorch itself doesn't survive, the list of PyTorch ops will stand the test of time as long as deep learning continues as like a programming paradigm. But the world wants more performance. So we should make like 100 new PyTorch backends and make them blazing fast and let the fastest one win, right? So, and let's give like Mojo a shot today. Thank you, everyone.